Hi, everyone. Welcome to Coders Craft. I'm Mike Fisher. I'm the CTO here at Etsy. Um, I'm going to keep my pitch um, that I do at the beginning of this really, really short. So um, Coders Craft is a great example of what Etsy does and the, the culture of learning and sharing knowledge. Um, we're doing a lot of wonderful things, some exciting things. Um, if you're interested, if this seems like the place of interest to you, definitely seek out one of us and chat with us. We've got um, engineering positions almost across the board from mobile to front end to full stack to machine learning. So that's my pitch. Um, so tonight I'm super excited to, uh, to get to introduce Kent Beck. Um, he holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in computer and information from the University of Oregon. Go Ducks. Go Ducks. Go Ducks. <laughs> um, he pioneered software design patterns. He developed the commercial application of small talk. He's the creator of extreme programming. He's published nine or more books, um, including the cult classic, Small Talk, Best Practice Patterns. Uh, many of us entered our careers or throughout our careers have read his books and were influenced by them. Uh, he wrote the S-Unit unit test framework, <coughs> excuse me, for Small Talk, which spawned the whole X-Unit series, J-Unit, PHP Unit, all of these. Um, he was one of the original 17 um, signatories on the Agile Manifesto. And he spent the last seven years um, as a technical coach at Facebook. And tonight, we're super excited to have him here to talk to us about the three X um, framework of explore, expand, and extract. So please join me in welcoming Kim Beck. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to uh, Etsy for sponsoring my visit here. Um, Great to see all of your happy faces in an evening when you could be doing something else. Um, I'm here to tell you a, a story of uh, my own confusion. So uh, seven years ago, I walked through the doors at Facebook. Uh, I'd been a goat farmer for uh, 10 years at that point. Goat farming is not some sort of metaphor. <laughs> I get a lot of, uh, oh, by goat, you mean? No, no, I mean goat. That's what I mean by goat. I lived on 20 acres in southern Oregon and uh, raised uh, five kids and a bunch of goats and um, kind of got away from the tech scene for quite a while. Um, seven years ago, though, I got a call from Facebook and I had uh, two kids going into college uh, for, for four straight years. I was going to have four years of, of two college tuition. So I said, sure, I'm interested in your cultural problems. And, uh, and, and so uh, there I was at Facebook. And I walked in the door. And I was actually very interested. Uh, uh, what I saw of the Facebook engineering culture was very different than anything that I had seen before. Uh, when I got there, I was more than interested. I was appalled because they weren't doing anything that I'd written in my books. <laughs> and, and if there's one thing that upsets an author more than people not doing what are, what's in the books is not doing what's in the books and succeeding. <laughs> like, this just can't happen. Uh, and yet, there was this seemingly very chaotic process. And, uh, and yet, the results were, were really spectacular. Uh, massive scale, massive scaling, uh, and uh, a strong force of innovation at the same time. So how does that come out of this chaotic process? So two weeks in, uh, I had my first hackathon. Hackathons are, are a lot of fun. They can be quite intense. You can get over your fears of failing at something because everybody's going to fail. And then every once in a while, somebody fails to fail, and then you succeed. And that's cool. So uh, we could sign up to give classes. And so there I am, the guy written the books, Showing up at Facebook, I thought, uh, like, how am I going to make my mark in this company? I thought, I know what I'm going to do. 
I'll give a class on test-driven development because after all, who wouldn't want to take a class on TDD from, well, me? <laughs> so the class just above mine was on advanced Excel techniques. And the class just below mine on the sign-up sheet was on Argentinian tango. <laughs> and when the time came for the classes to take place, the advanced Excel class was completely full. The Argentinian tango class was completely full. And I had zero signups for my class on test-driven development. Yeah, I know, thanks. Your, your pity, I can't tell you how much your pity means to me. So I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do here? How am I going to have any influence if nobody's going to listen to me? And I made the most difficult decision of my technical career, which was to forget everything I knew about software engineering and see if I could relearn software engineering from scratch fast enough not to get fired. And that worked for seven years. Then it didn't, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, uh, so what I would do is just, uh, if I thought, well, this has got to be split up into multiple little PRs, right? And no, no, I'll just put it all together. Really? Yeah, really? OK. I need to write tests for this, right? Nah, you don't need to write tests for that. Really? Nah, it's fine. Well, OK. So just monkey see, monkey do. I copied what the people around me were doing. <clears throat> I spent about a year as a developer uh, and didn't have a lot of success. I'm not a complexity person. I can't handle making really complicated things work. Uh, sometimes I'm able to make complicated things simple and then make simple things work. But if I start with a lot of complexity, I, I have a hard time. So uh, about a year in, I converted to uh, coaching engineers one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I noticed that there were a lot of the mentoring kind of conversations that I'd had. Uh, when I got to Tektronix, Ward Cunningham was my mentor the guy who went on to invent the wiki. Um, and we had great conversations, sometimes on topic, sometimes c completely off topic, whatever that means. And I just didn't see those conversations happening. So I thought, let me get that rolling at Facebook. This is clearly a company that's going to have a, a long lifespan, and it needs that kind of generational uh, communication and learning going on. So I started, a coaching, started coaching myself. Uh, it was quite successful. There's a whole talk to be told about, uh, about that and setting up coaching programs and so on. And I'm happy to discuss that at some other time because I do have a point that I'm going to get to, I promise, um, th that has nothing to do with that. So I, I started coaching, and that let me pair program all over the Facebook code base, and uh, talk to lots of engineers and understand their experience of development and, and where they, they had problems. I expected coaching to be kind of technical. You know, we'll talk about patterns, we'll talk about TDD. Turns out, nah, none of that. Uh, Mid-level engineers are really good at learning technical stuff. What mid-level engineers have a really hard time with, and even some very senior engineers, is all the personal and interpersonal stuff. So I spent most of my time telling stories, and someone would say, uh, I'm so uniquely broken because everyone else here is so much smarter than I am, and they're about to find out, and the day they do, I'm going to be fired. And I say, oh, you're doing the thing. You know, I do the thing too, or I used to do the thing, or let me tell you about 10 years ago, or let me tell you about last week, or sometimes tell you about 30 years ago, and then you weren't born yet, were you? And I hated it. When I was a young engineer and some old engineer go, eh, I've been doing this since before you were born, kid. <laughs> I hated that. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's just really annoying as a young engineer. I can tell you, as an old engineer, 
It's enormously satisfying to say that. <laughs> oh, just like, oh. Well, when, when did you first do this? Oh, uh, in 1992. When were you born? 95. Yeah. <laughs> God, it feels so good. Anyway, fast forward five years. A, two years ago, April. Two years ago, April, I had a, a pair of two, two pieces of information come together. Ideas are very seldom a thing. It's much more common for two things or three things to come together, and it's the combination of things that really, that's what uh, sparks the insight. So uh, years before, uh, I'm not smart, I'm, I'm persistent. So I had heard a, uh, a podcast with Nassim Taleb, is that a name that people know of? where he talked about the difference between convex and concave payouts. So a uh, convex payout is where you make a small investment, and if we sorted the payoffs, most of the time you lose your entire investment, and every once in a while you win big. And it's called convex because if a little guy stands right here and looks in this direction, this curve is convex. That's what took me eight years to figure out. <laughs> I'm not really good with spatial reasoning. So there you go. So this is convex. And if you're in a convex world, you should make uh, lots of little investments because it's very unlikely that any single investment's going to pay off. If you can reduce the cost of an investment so you can make twice as many investments, that's you double the value of your activity. And, uh, and you can lose 10 times in a row, 100 times in a row, and it doesn't mean you're making any mistakes, which is kind of feels weird. Okay, so this is convex. Concave is the opposite. You make a large investment. Most of the time, you have a small payoff, and every once in a while, you have a huge, huge loss. So this is concave. Because if a little guy stands right here and looks up in this direction, this curve is concave. If you're in a concave world, you behave completely different than in a convex world. In a con concave world, the way you create more value is either reducing the downside risk or reducing the probability of that, that big negative payoff or increasing this payoff just a little bit. Because you're very likely to get this payoff uh, if you can make it a little bit bigger, go from 1 to 1.2%, all of a sudden this is a much more valuable investment to make. But your primary incentive is to not mess it up. So you have to be very conservative in a concave world. Okay. There's idea number one. I finally figured out the little guy story. I thought, okay, now I understand this difference between convex and concave. At the same time, the second idea that came crashing into that was I started hearing smart, experienced people suggest a software process that sounded a lot like the waterfall to say, well, you know, the way you develop new products is you carefully research the business model. Didn't use the A word. We're going to research the business and validate the business model. Who can argue with that? And then we will uh, 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 do the uh, product design that will satisfy that business model. And then there's some implementation stuff. And then the, the big uh, improvement on the waterfall is that you ship first and test after. <laughs> and now younger me would hear this waterfall story and think, morons, right? These people are just idiots to think this could ever work. It never works. Why don't you just stop doing this, Dumbo? Which made all of the friends 
that you can imagine that that approach would make. This time, though, older, wiser, or at least slower me, you know, you can't always tell the difference between wise and slow. <laughs> There's a lesson in that. Said, maybe these people who are advocating this very phased approach, maybe they're solving a different problem than I'm solving. Maybe it's not that they're idiots, it's just that they're trying to do something that I don't care about. Whether it's effective or not is a completely separate issue. And I'd had this epiphany about the little guy in convex and concave, and I thought, oh, the waterfall is trying to deal with concave situations. All that planning is going into trying to avoid this downside. Now, it doesn't actually do that, and it doesn't achieve the, achieve the upside, but the purpose of it is not rank stupidity. Few people are trying to be stupid or evil. It just works out that way. Uh, what I care about much more because of my nature is this convex world. You know, I love projects that are crazy and people just, I tell them my crazy idea and they just look at me. And my, for me, projects are over the first time somebody says, that might work. I think, ah, I got to go find a new project now. I love this convex world. Okay, so now we had those two things together. Convex and concave and waterfall-y stuff is trying to deal, ineffectively, but trying to deal with a concave world. My friend uh, Chiago Hirai looked at this and listened to me and said, you know what, you could put those curves together. And so I did. And it looks like this. I thought, oh, sigmoid curve, like, yeah, that's, Lots of people know about that. Um, but there is a continuum here, in a sense. Any product that's successful, any company that's successful, goes through this kind of evolution. At the beginning, you're looking for that spark. You're looking for some kind of reinforcing loop where the bigger you get, the easier it is to get bigger. That's the network effect, uh, lots of different names for it. It's hard to find a new one of these, right? The, 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 the ones that everybody knows about are already taken. They've already grown big, and it's hard. If somebody else owns one of these reinforcing loops, it's really hard to take over from them unless they really mess up MySpace. <laughs> I'm still a little proud of Facebook, so. Now, Towards the latter parts of this curve, there's an there's a inhibiting loop that says the bigger you get, the harder it is to get bigger. So once you've already signed up all the humans on the planet, it's really hard to grow the customer base. Um, and any rumors about whales and dolphins, I can neither confirm nor deny uh, with respect to Facebook. But uh, th this uh, inhibiting loop kicks in. All right, so now, remember, I, uh, back at Facebook, I'm looking at these people doing this chaotic development process and trying to understand how it could possibly work. And um, I had this drawn, and I realized, oh, while the Facebook development process looks chaotic, there's, it's not consistently chaotic. There's patterns in it, in the chaos. And here's the pattern. If you're down here, and you're looking for this new uh, reinforcing growth loop, there's a certain set of behaviors that make for effective exploration. This is you're in this convex world, you got nothing to lose, everything to gain. 
this is experimental world. Uh, you don't analyze what's the potential of this idea because you don't know whether there's one of these reinforcing loops or not. You know, I, I talked about ideas coming together like let's make a messaging app and instead of saving all the messages forever and carefully indexing them, we'll just throw them away every day. Right, how stupid is it to, right, Snapchat, right? They found a new one of these loops. But you don't find these by sitting and thinking. You find these by trying this, trying that, trying this, trying that. Holy crap, like we had no idea. This was the same thing we tried two weeks ago. It's a little tiny little twist maybe. So exploration is a experimental land. The more experiments you can run per dollar or per day, the more value you create. The more uh, diversity you have in your experiments, the more value you create. The more you can take learnings from one experiment and pass them to the next experiment, the more value you create. This is about, you've got this big space of possible problems and a big space of possible solutions, and you're trying to find unique, two unique points in there that connect in a way that nobody's ever seen before. Now once you're up here and you're extracting value from this big success that you've already had, the game is completely different. When you're extracting value, the team's bigger, uh, you know where value is coming from, user's behavior is predictable, if we make things 10% faster, we get 14% more whatevers. Like you know where those, those relationships are. A managing an extract project is a totally different deal than managing an explore project. You, you have known metrics with uh, fairly well understood uh, investments you can make and fairly well understood payoffs that come from those investments. And then it's a, this is an ROI business. This is where ROI really makes sense. Anybody who goes to a startup and asks for an ROI story, you just, you're asking the wrong questions. It's like asking how many eggs a baseball team lays. <laughs> like they don't lay eggs, but, but I wanna know before, like no, it's just a different deal. You can't, this is just, is this crazy? Yeah, not a problem. Is this crazy enough to work? Yeah, okay. That's the best you can do in exploration. Now go explore. Go find out how users really behave. And the quicker you can make the connection between, huh, I wonder how they would react if we did this. And then you deploy something and you observe how they actually behave. The shorter that gap, the better you're exploring. So those are the two ends of it. This is the concave world. You don't want to screw things up. You don't want to lose the momentum that you've gained. The explore world, you have nothing to lose, and you should experiment as wildly as you can. I got lots more I could say about that, but that's not my point tonight. And a lesson that I learned from Facebook is there's this gap in the middle that I call expand, where, okay, you've tried this and tried that and tried this and nothing's working and then boo, all of a sudden users react to something that you did 10 times more, 100, 1,000 times more than they've ever reacted to anything else and you start hitting uh, barriers to growth. So, uh, Explore, you're just looking for something. In Expand, now the, the boulder is rolling downhill and you're running as fast as you can just to try and keep up. So over and over again, you hit some barrier to growth, another, another, another. And each of these barriers looks the same in an abstract sense. You have su the supply of some rate limiting resource like CPU power or floor space or employees or 
the network bandwidth, and you have demand that's growing exponentially, but with a, a bigger exponent than the supply, and you have a day on which you die. Yeah? And your job in expansion is to take this demand curve and bend it down a little bit and to take the supply curve and bend it up a little bit so that the two don't cross. So you're like, well, we're going to die if we don't get more disks somehow. All right, so let's use a little less disk. Let's buy more disks. And then uh, at least it won't kill us anymore. OK, fine. This is, this is a duct tape land. Uh, this is uh, not about cost effectiveness. It's just about effectiveness. Um, this is the B round of venture financing, right? You've, you've found a machine that if you put a dollar in, you get $2 out, except it's not going to work for $10 and $20 unless you do X. And then it won't work for $100 and $2 unless you do Y. So you're just overcoming these obstacles one after another after another. So let's say we're, we have a team, we're exploring, we're trying a bunch of crazy ideas, we're, we're enjoying the creative freedom, and then all hell breaks loose. Come in one day and disks are full and servers are catching fire. It's really easy in that moment to go, well, Fixing all of these technical problems is a pain, but we should just keep exploring because that's what we know how to do. And so the, the first mistake on this curve is not making the transition from explore to expand. Um, the thing is, you don't get to decide when this transition occurs. Uh, the, the market is going to tell you that it's time to expand. So uh, in 1997, Ha. <laughs> I'm going to let you do the math. Uh, Eric Gamma and I got on an airplane, and we flew from Vienna to Washington, DC. And he was going to show me Java, and I was going to show him this testing framework stuff. Now, we had each written hundreds of programs at that point, You know, sat down, typed main, and gone on from there. So it was going pretty well, but lots of programs had gone pretty well for the first three or four hours. We finally landed in DC, another humorous story involving an upset federal agent, got to the conference in Atlanta, and we handed this first version of JUnit to Martin Fowler. The next day, we had 30, 40 people demanding floppy disks with, uh, with, with this program. That had never happened before. That's the transition from explore to expand. It's not something you get to decide. It's something your market decides. Like, whoa, never seen this before. When that happens, it's time to shift gears. It's as if you just learned how to play uh, what we in America call soccer. And there is going to be a big soccer tournament. You know that, don't you? It's kind of fun. I didn't get, I, I wanted to cheer for Nigeria. I have a lot of friends in Nigeria, but they're, Shirts sold out, like instantly. So now I'm cheering for Switzerland, but it's a, I got the shirt. So where is that going? OK, transition. Uh, oh, you just learned how to play soccer. And then the person with the black and white stripes blows a whistle, grabs the, that round ball, and puts out a rugby ball. If you keep playing soccer, you're going to be buried under a pile of very large, aggressive people. You have to change gears and say, ah, no. Now it's time to play this new game by these new rules. Uh, and what's the first thing that's going to kill us? And how are we going to make sure that it just barely doesn't kill us? OK, now what's the next thing? Let's make sure that doesn't kill us. And the next thing, and the next thing. So that's the explore, expand tra transition, and people don't make it. Uh, next mistake, 
that happens is just missing one of these existential crises, because each one of these really is an existential crisis. Um, in, when you're exploring, you have a small chance of a large payout. When you're extracting, you have a large chance of a small payout. Expand is the only place where you have a large chance of a large payout. So this is the most valuable, the most profitable part of software development. Uh, it's very intense. This is where it's fine to spend extra hours. This is where it's fine to work unsustainably because it's a brief period. We'll get to the not making that transition next. So uh, the, the techniques, the skills needed to be a successful expander, though, are very different than the skills necessary to be an explorer. Oftentimes in expansion, you're looking for technical wizardry. Somebody who explains, ah, yes, uh, CentOS 7.1 now has a configuration, da 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 da, -da. You know, and two-thirds through that sentence, I've, I'm just hoping this works. And they, somebody comes in and does their technical wizardry, pries these two curves apart, and then how we're going to live to see another day. So second mistake is you get to one of these hurdles, and you stumble, you smack into it, and you fall. The problem is you've just blown a really profitable opportunity when you do that. These don't come along very often. I've had maybe three or four of these in my career, and I think I'm extremely lucky. This doesn't happen often. You really don't want to blow one of these when it hits you. OK, so now you, you get a ways up, and eventually you're able to start making predictions about growth. You, the picture of hey, if we do a little more of this, a little more of that happens. That starts to, to appear. You say, well, OK, there's a 1,000 things that matter, but there's three things that really matter. And here's how we measure them. And here's how they're related. And now you've made that transition from expand to extract. If you don't notice that you've made that transition, and you continue working unsustainably, eventually people burn out. You run out of capital. Um, this is more of a decision. The explore to expand transition, that's the market gets to decide, and you don't get to decide. The expand to extract decision is a business decision, and it can be a real, um, it can be ambiguous where you go. It's like, when do you do this? Uber is a great example right now of people who went way farther expanding than I thought was wise. Um, but, you know, what do I know? Just, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here talking to you people. No, no offense, but like, <laughs> if, if I could make these kinds of decisions, I'd be talking to you, but I'd be dressed much nicer than this. <laughs> so this is more of a decision. Like, when do you start? When do you say, OK, we're going to work sustainably. We're going to take profits out of, of what we've done and, uh, and give them back to the investors, pay for more exploration, whatever you, you want to do with it. Um, but again, it's as if the black and white shirted person blows the whistle, and now the rugby ball goes away, and out comes an American football and out trots a new opposing team, and the rules are all different, and your strategy has to change. Now you're looking for economies of scale. Now the timelines stretch way out. In Explore, the timelines are set by how much money you have to, to spend exploring. In Expand, it's this incredibly compressed timeline where you're just trying to survive until tomorrow. In Extract, this can go on for decades. Um, so the, the rules change, the strategy changes, the size of the teams change. Oftentimes, the people who are involved change. Like, I'm an explorer. Uh, I go in to expand sometimes. Uh, I never last very long in extract, because I'm just not interested in coming in Monday knowing that on Friday, I will have solved a problem that I already knew about Monday morning. Mm. I, I, that's a failed week for me. 
I want, I want to have three new problems to have throughout the week, like, oh, no, I need to solve this. Oh, no, 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 I really need to solve this. That's what I love. That's a maximum learning for me. So it's a new set of, uh, a new set of problems, a new strategy, new capital structure, new management style, new people, new number of people involved, new org structure, like that everything's different. The next mistake that happens, now th let's say we've gotten through this once. Whew, right, feels good, we're a success. Uh, now the fun begins. Now, it, now the hard part, and this is what Facebook did a really good job of for a very long time, is you need to manage all three phases at the same time, even though they demand completely different styles. The explorers have to be explorations with a limited budget and unlimited freedom to search for a new growth loop. Expands need to be absolutely focused on whatever the next thing that's going to kill you is. And the extracts need to be operating sustainably on well understood metrics with well understood inputs and outputs and relationships between the two. The last and, and uh, most common problem once you get through this once is the extractors get to be in charge. Right? Extractors look like adults, unlike everybody else. Right? The expanders are just people with their hair on fire, assuming they have hair, with their hair on fire. Self-deprecating bald humor doesn't work here. I'm going <laughs> to just self yeah, never mind. Uh, and the explorers just look like nutbags. Right? How are you going to make money off this? Blah, who cares? You know, you, you wouldn't believe what we tried to get users to do yesterday. Right? They look crazy, and they can't tell you how they're going to make any money. And the extractors say, I'm paying the bills. I'm keeping the lights on, number one. Number two, my projects don't fail. So let me be in charge, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to organize the explore projects, like extract projects. So now we're going to launch into a new market, and we will carefully define the business model, design the blah, 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 right? In the end, it's just the same experiment that two crazy people could have run in, in six hours, but it cost six months and $20 million, right? That same exact piece of information. No, nobody's going to click on that button, right? You can get that feedback in six hours, or you can get that feedback in six months. Well, the extractor is going to get it in six months. If they're in explore world, it makes no sense. But that doesn't stop us. So the extractors get to be in charge, and they try and run everything as an extract project. And then innovation ceases. Timelines stretch out further and further and further. The number of experiments you run goes further and further down. The the innovation of the experiments goes down further and further. And then uh, you have yet another behemoth that just n never really survived into being able to uh, sustain itself for a long period of time. So questions about anything I've talked about so far? Stunned silent. Yes, ma'am. Do we have a? Yeah, yes, please. You don't have to jog, but I appreciate it. I like your shirt. Why, oh, thank you. Uh, I work here, and I'm wondering what, uh, like, who, who are the people, how are the people represented, like the extractors and the explorers, like, or what, what would your recommendation be? So is this like sometimes people are doing one thing and at other times they're doing another? Is it like... Like, how would you structure a team to make this effective? Ah, yeah, I think that's, and if it was easy, everybody would do it, and we wouldn't have anything to talk about. So this is difficult and ambiguous. The best structure I know that I've seen is 
the way Facebook did it in the fairly early days. And that's, there's a lot of mobility between the different teams. So you're working on extraction for something, we're drinking adult beverages late at night, we go, ah, wouldn't it be crazy if we swapped the thing with the other thing, ha, 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 nobody would ever click on that. How hard is that to try? And now we're exploring. And we try it and like, people are, uh, like are using this and we thought nobody would use it. So then we try a few more things and yep, this is starting to scale and starting to break our infrastructure. So you fix a few technical barriers and then eventually like the product problems start getting boring and it, it's all technical scaling problems. And then I drink adult beverages with somebody else and come up with another crazy idea. So it's very fluid. It's not like you have an explore team, an expand team, and an extract team. That said, at Facebook in the early days, there was a large contingent of expanders who were just waiting, licking their chops for the next technical uh, problem worthy of their wizardry. And when one would come up, they would drop whatever they were doing and pile in to work on that expand problem. And when they did, whoever was managing the team that they were leaving would say, super, this is what Facebook needs you to do. Somebody else is gonna pick up the work that you just dropped. Go do the thing that's more important. That's really difficult to create the incentive system where, <clears throat> where people are willing. Remember, this is guaranteed money. This is 1,000 in, 2,000 out. And you have to say, look, this thing that we don't know how it's going to monetize is blowing up, and it's blowing up. And so I'm going to take the best people off of this team that, that are guaranteed to make money and just go fix the notification system so that the service talks to the other service, yada, yada, yada. But it's, it's very fluid. The people are moving around between the teams. Once it gets big, once, the, once development starts feeling like a zero-sum game, like if your team's metrics go up, then your team's metrics are gonna go down, then it's really hard to sustain that level of generosity of spirit that just says, well, yeah, go try that, sure. Sometimes I'd see people go off and do things at Facebook, and I'm like, this is a waste of time. Why are you, this is the, no, don't do this. You were working on something important. Well, that's not my call. That's, that's your call. If you have an idea and you want to pursue it and you want to deal with the consequences of failure, then it's not my place to tell you not to do this. Yeah, go for it. Does that answer your question? Okay, super. Yeah. Hi. I, I don't work here, but it looks like a really nice place to work. <laughs> I, I'm, um, not on, I'm not on commission, but I haven't seen anything to contradict you. I guess you sort of just answered my question a little bit, but I guess like how do you really know what phase you're in? And potentially like when you're in the extract phase, isn't that also like the Windows XP phase where you're just sitting there like stagnating for a decade? Like how, isn't there any room to like optimize that extract phase or? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So to your second one, this looks boring to me, but it's not because if I take some segment of this curve and I blow it up, it doesn't really look like that. It looks like this. Right? At a smaller scale, with less at risk, but still, like, pff, how are we going to get three more percent out of this? I don't know. We got eight ideas. Can we figure out how to make experimenting with all eight ideas cheap enough that we can just try all eight? That's an interesting technical problem to figure out how to reduce the cost of experimentation. If you can't, then you have to figure out how to prioritize them. That's interesting. Once an idea starts to take off, like how far can we, this is better than we thought, how far can we push it? That's a really exciting moment. So, Extraction is not boring. It's interesting. And this is, I haven't talked about uh, axes yet. I drew a graph. I talked for half an hour. Nobody challenged me on the axes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm not going to say what the units are, but it's definitely logarithmic. 
<laughs> so a little bit better here is huge in absolute, absolute number. Just as a little bit better here is huge in absolute, I mean, this is exactly the same payoff. So that's why extraction's not, not boring. So your first question? Uh, how do you really know what phase you're in? Okay, so if you, if you know how users are going to react to changes that you make, then you're extracting. If you don't know what's going to kill you next, then, but you know something is, then you're expanding. This is paranoia of ill. If, uh, if you have great confidence that you know how users are going to behave, but you're lying to yourself, <laughs> then you're exploring. It's odd. Thank does, you. Does that answer your question? Okay, super, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my question is around how do you, how much, from your experience, how much privacy slash openness do you give um, for the teams working in the explore phase uh, in relation to the extractors or expanders? My experience is that often people try to harvest things or pull people into the big process world a little too soon. Um, so what's your take on that? Yeah, so uh, Innovator's Dilemma has a lot to say about, you know, that you take the explorers and you put them down in Boca Raton, Florida, <laughs> right, to use an example from actual programming history. Uh, I think that's kind of a cop-out. I think asking everyone to understand that there's a whole curve, the different segments of the curve have different trade-offs and require different behaviors, and that sometimes people moving from one part of a curve to another is exactly what the business needs. Like, I'm still naive slash optimistic enough to believe that that can actually work. So that's, and I watched it work at Facebook for much, much of my time there. So uh, that's gonna be my bias. And yeah, the extractors get to say, look, I've got this, you know, we can get rid of half the servers if only we do this, you know, year and a half project. Well, cool, that's a thing that needs to happen. But that doesn't mean that exploration should stop, not at all, unless, we, unless we're in pure cash cow mode. Like when this whole, there's a, actually another X, there's a fourth X, when this whole thing goes backwards, and then eventually it just dies out. Well, if, if you're there and you can, you can bend this up a little bit, then that's fine. I just don't give a rip about that part of the curve, so I don't include it in the model. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think also for me, it, um, I'm interested in understanding the gateways when someone says we're ready, um, and this is more so in, uh, so I work in operations and in process design, so the thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is not, tell, not um, expressing how do you know when you're an explorer versus expand, but when does the organi like what are the moments that an organization decides to move projects from explore into expand or expand to extract to make sure that there's a good balance between all three of those, that you're not starving one in service of another. Right, so the explore to expand transition is not up to you. Mm -hmm. That's, people are screaming at us because our service doesn't work. Do you know how, what good news it is when people are screaming at you because your <laughs> service doesn't work? That is the best thing that can happen to you after you've had six months of crickets. Because it means, you know, the, the opposite, the opposing team in exploration is indifference. Like, that's also your big advantage. That's why you can try crazy stuff because nobody cares. Cool. All of a sudden, people care, and they're saying, oh, I can't use this when I'm offline. You're like, well, we didn't even think people would use it when they were offline, but apparently it's so important. That, like, whoa, like, how are we going to fix that just good enough for right now? Mm -hmm. So that transition, you don't get to decide. The expand to extract transition is a business decision. Somebody has to decide it. Uh, process design, playbooks, run books, that belongs in extract, absolutely. Yeah. This is the 40th time we've done this. Can we just automate this? Can we write down what this, you know, we always forget step 17. Let's just, 
make a list and there's a step 17 and if you don't do it, you know, what, you know bad things happen to you. Th that definitely belongs in extract because sure. it's part of that optimization. Yeah, uh, totally. We're aligned. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Uh, hi. So the question I have is, you start an exploration. <laughs> you start an exploration and uh, you're being asked, well, how are you going to expand? How do you address that? Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Right, but say the people who are asking this question have some sort of power over your ability. To <laughs> yeah, this is a pointed question. <laughs> um, what the honest answer is, we don't know, but we will deal with it when it happens. If if the honest answer is not good enough in your organization then um, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, and it, I, I'm privileged enough to just go, yeah. If, if you need me to promise, to make promises to you that I know I can't keep, then I just don't need to be here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> How much? Hey, yeah. So how do you make sure that engineers can actually move between the phases without like any like, animosity? Like how do you keep that culture so that people can go from like expand to extract and like back and forth without, you know, ill will, anything like that? F uh, ill will from whom to whom? Like I think that's like, I feel like being in the extract phase is a little less sexy than being in the expand phase. So like, like how do you, like for like people that like, like work on infrastructure, like run books and things like that, how do you like still make it like, feel like good work, I like. I think you're projecting. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, which I've done in my life, which is how I recognize it, to say, everybody wants to explore. Like, what kind of boring person wants to live in extract? Sure. Well, it turns out other people do want to live in extract, and that doesn't make them boring. <laughs> right? I love this, this uh, exploration. But that doesn't mean everybody does. I kind of don't like expansion because it's like it's a little too chaotic for me. There are people who want to come in Monday morning and know that by Friday they will have made X metric 2% better and they take great satisfaction from that and they make a lot of money for the company doing that and they're happy to receive in salary a small fraction of the money they make for doing that and thank goodness for those people. <laughs> because somebody has to pay me. <laughs> but, I, but I think that it, it, like appreciating each other certainly makes sense. Like dissing somebody because they, you know, you just make things 2% better. <laughs> Loser. Like that's just stupid. No, we, th and that's the point of 3X, to have uh, uh, an idea reach its full potential you need to have projects going on in all three at the same time and appreciating each other and recognizing that there's times to move between, for people to move between projects so that they can get back to their home phase, I think that makes perfect sense. But it, like, oh, these are just slaves, you know, and, and how do we throw them enough cake so that they'll continue uh, executing their run books, I think is selling them and their motivations short. Cool, that's a fair answer. So like, how do you actually like appreciate them, like, like what tangible things did you see that, like besides paying them? Yeah, oh yeah, I think uh, p pay is the weakest incentive <laughs> that we have. Uh, I'm not against it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to be incentivized by pay, but I think it is a weak incentive. I, I think uh, now we get, now we're into like culture encouragement mode, which is another two hours of conversation, I think storytelling, but it all boils down to storytelling. What stories do you tell? Do you tell just stories about explorers who persevere against insane odds and come up with the crazy idea that actually works? Do you tell stories about the expanders who stay late at night to install whatever on 40 gajillion servers and that saved the day? Do you tell stories about the extractors who plugged away at some project for 18 months and then saved the company $20 million a year. Well, 
The answer is you should tell all those stories. Cool, thanks. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you mentioned for the explorers, uh, one of the things that you said is they don't have anything to lose. Can you um, maybe expand on that a little bit more? Well, you have your job to lose. Yeah, so like what, what, is, what is like, I guess, failure? In a liquid of, job market, yeah. that's well, nothing. Like how do you, like what are the things that keep explorers what, like, am I wrong? sustainable? Yeah. Well, so when you're exploring, you're going to have a, a bunch of bustos. Yeah. If you don't, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> Um, so the way it worked at Facebook is, yeah, you could tell your manager, I'm just going to go try this thing for two months. That's fine. Your manager, especially right when I joined 2011, 12, 13, your manager had no way of telling you, no, you can't do that. You would just go and do it. If it worked, you're golden. If it didn't work though, you better come back and notch up some wins before the end of the review period because things could get sticky if you didn't do that. Right. And if you, if, you, if you had a couple of review periods without any wins, people would begin asking really awkward questions. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, is that, is that so, sort of what you were talking about, like being fluid amongst the different... Yes. Like you can't just stay and explore... And I guess not produce anything. No, no, no. You can't just stay and explore. Like my, my actual strategy, the one where I abandon projects as soon as people think they're a good idea, that's not a profit maximizing strategy. <laughs> just, just to be clear. Uh, let me take uh, uh, one more question now, and then I, I have uh, the, I'm going to tie this together improbably with the theme of the uh, of this talk series. So go ahead, sir. Yeah, so the company's, uh, company will have different parts of the organization and different parts of these phases. How, what are the ways that executives should approach these phases differently and or consistently? Because like, uh, you need to treat people and the people in them, right, uh, the same too. There's like places where you want to be consistent or different. How, do, how, do they, how should we expect people to, treat, to approach those questions? Yeah, so... Extractors are judged, number one, on did you screw it up or not? Because you really don't want to screw it up. Number two, did you achieve predictable progress on well-understood metrics? Uh, did you achieve the economies of scale that are out there? Um, did you work in a sustainable way? That, that all makes sense in the extract world. Uh, from the wording of your question, it sounds like, how do you treat people the same across all three? And I think that's completely impossible. OK. That, maybe that's the answer then. So in exploration, if it's my money, if I'm giving you my money and saying, OK, go explore with this, what I want to know is I tried this, I tried this, I tried this. I tried this thing, and it only cost me half as much as trying the first three things because I learned how to do experiments better. Excellent. That's a good use of my, of my money in your hands. Uh, if you tell me, well, I, I tried 20 things. They were reasonable bets. None of them paid off. I think, OK, that's fine. Maybe we stop looking in this direction and we go a different direction. You're still accountable for the money, my money that you spent, but you're not accountable for success. You're accountable for efficient exploration. In expansion, it's just really clear. Did, did you die? Did you not die? <laughs> so as long as you keep the project alive at whatever cost, you're golden. And if you didn't, then we have the difficult, this, the difficult conversation. So the company would need to be dealing with teams in, uh, at, at, in these three different buckets very differently then? Yep, 100%. So extract, oftentimes these are big projects. I was talking to a telco, their minimum project size was $75 million of investment. And the word template for a project proposal was 46 pages long. That's just the template. That's before you put any content in it. <laughs> that makes sense for an extract project. You're spending 75 million of my dollars, which I don't have, just to be clear. <laughs> If you put those same constraints on explore projects, you're never going to explore anything interesting. 
So Explore needs to be its own bucket of money. It gets doled out in much smaller increments. Like, OK, try that for two weeks. All right, that smells promising. You know, try it, to now have four people work on it for two months. But it's got to be a different bucket of money. It has to be, because you just can't, you can't administer it the same way as you administer the money for extract projects. And expansion trumps everything. Like, keep this alive, I don't care how much you spend. Unless you don't keep it alive, in which case, I don't care how much you spend. Does that answer your question? OK, so I had this extended period of uh, goat farming slash meditation slash contemplation. And I kind of missed some stuff. Uh, it was one of the original 17 pale male signatories to the uh, Agile Manifesto. I love that phrase, pale male. It just sums it all up so nicely. Um, actually, I'm the first signatory. It's Beck et al because my name comes first alphabetically. <laughs> the, uh, the whole software as craft movement was kind of post me going into seclusion. So I, I missed that. I missed Agile uh, blowing up in all the senses of that phrase. Uh, and now I'm back. And, and the thing about 3x is once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Now, if somebody asks me, estimates or no estimates, I'm like, well, where are you on the curve? If you're exploring, of course you don't have estimates because you've never done it before. Estimating would be stupid. If you're extracting and you're not estimating, well, you've done this before. Of course you estimate or you're stupid. Craft, to me, is the, is the um, has that same structure to it. Depends on what you mean by craft. There is a craft of extraction. There's an engineering discipline of extraction which says, I'm going to take the normal human bias towards short term, and I'm going to extend it. I'm going to deliberately make long term illiquid investments by writing tests, by refactoring, by automation, by big infrastructure projects. I'm going to do all these things that may not be in my immediate short-term best interest, but are in the best interest of the project. And that is the craft of extraction. But that's not the only craft there is. There's a craft to exploration where you say, what happens if we switch the thing with the other thing? How will users behave? And somebody says, ha. Just so happens that if you understand the template engine, which I do because I wrote it, you know that if you put two tabs, blah, 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 magic happens and we get to find out today what happens if you switch the thing with the other thing. There's a craft to exploration about uh, putting in the minimum effort necessary to answer a question by observing users' behavior in the shortest possible period of time. Now, it's not sustainable. The code that comes out, about, out of that is horrific, which is why you delete all the experiments that don't come out the way you want them to come out. That's part of the craft, too. But to say, oh, well, software craftsmanship means I will ship no software before its time is, is to be entirely too focused on one person's aesthetic. My, you know, I like beautifully structured code with little methods and perfectly uh, chosen names and, and no explicit uh, branching logic. That's one kind of craft, but it's not the only kind of craft. There's also a craft to expansion. There's people who are really good at duct tape. And that is an engineering discipline to say, uh, if cost is no object, how can I keep this system running tomorrow? OK, it, it, by lowering, and how can I lower the risk that the system isn't going to be running tomorrow? That is a craft of its own, and it's different than the exploration craft and different than the extraction craft. So I'm happy to talk about the craft of software development, except I want to talk about the crafts of software development. Because depending on the context, depending on how the trade-offs went, 
that craft, what it constitutes, what constitutes a crafty behavior versus non-crafty behavior looks very different. Oh, cowboy coders. Yeah, you know what? If you if you find this loop with cowboy coding, whatever the cow person coding, whatever the it doesn't sound so nasty when you say cow person coding. But anyway, <laughs> sloppy. If you if you're if you code sloppy and find one of these loops, you won. You can eventually pay for all of your sins <laughs> in cash. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. There is a craft to exploration and a different craft to expansion and a different craft to extraction. And the sooner we can talk about them as separate aesthetics, separate engineering disciplines, separate sets of trade-offs, the sooner we can get good at all three and begin creating more value out of the software that we develop. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Please join us outside.